Welcome to Theater Spotlight, coming to you over LAArtStream.com. I am your host, Julio Martinez. And before we launch into this segment, I have to take you back 10 years. I think it's 10 years. Anyway, I was working as a theater critic for Daily Variety and the Daily News. And the Daily News editor always wanted me to pick something that was San Fernando Valley relevant. And I got a call from him and he said, I think there's this ragtag theater company that sort of tours around without a home. They're going to be at Cal State University Northridge. Uh, why don't you go catch them? No obligation to review. If you don't think they're worth reviewing, just sneak off and go home. So anyway, I go to the performance, and there I see one of the most raw-boned, bare-naked, just trimmed-down production of Henry V. And everything that Shakespeare wanted in that play was in the play. And that was my introduction to the independent Shakespeare company. Now, before I launch into my interview, I have to tell you, I later interviewed the artistic director and Mr. Henry V, David Melville. And one of the questions I asked him was, what is your biggest wish? And he said, oh, I wish we had a home. So here we are today. Wow, you've got a good memory. <laughs> <laughs> David, can you tell me where we are right at this moment? Uh, yes, we're in the independent studio, we call it now, or well, the independent Shakespeare Company studio, but I guess we dropped the Shakespeare because this is, well, basically this is our uh, rehearsal room, but in the off season, um, we use it for uh, just developing experimental productions and small things, so we can have 49 seats in here. Um, so, uh, uh, so we now call it the Independent Studio. And we're running. Uh, last year, we started running uh, some shows in it, and it's you know proving to be quite successful. Forty-nine seats. Forty-nine seats. Yeah. That's a bit different from your summer audience <laughs> when you're out there at Griffith Park. It is. Thousands. Yeah, we've started playing to thousands and thousands of people, which is amazing. Well, the uh, wonderful part about it, at least for the audience, it's free. It is. It's good and it's free. It's still absolutely free, but <laughs> donations are gratefully accepted. <laughs> uh, well, here in the studio, you're currently running a production you wrote, right? Yes. And can you tell me what it is, what the history of it was? And then you can introduce the very kind, gentle, er erudite looking fellow to your right. right. Looking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the show is called Red Barn, um, and it's based on a true story of a murder that happened in 1827 in the village of Polstead in England, which is uh, not far from where I grew up in uh, Great Hawksley. Um, and it's on the Essex-Suffolk border in East Anglia. Um, and the basic story is that this sort of wealthy country gentleman um, uh, murders his girlfriend, who's the daughter of the local mole catcher, um, and buries what her. What else are you going to do with <laughs> uh, And buries her in the barn where they used to go for their trysts, which was called the Red Barn. Uh, red barns are very uncommon in, in Britain, um, the, you know, everywhere in America. But this one was called the Red Barn, not because it was red, but it turned red at sunset because the uh, oh. the, the sun turned it this eerie color of red. Um, so he buried her in the barn and then uh, managed to pass off her disappearance with a sort of these increasingly outrageous lies. Like, uh, you know, she'd moved to Yarmouth and was staying with friends and, and, and she hadn't written because there was a sore on her hand or, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and people bought it um, and uh, he eventually skipped out of the village and went down to London and started a new life, put an advert in the Sunday Times for a wife, had a hundred replies married one of these women and set up a school for young ladies. <laughs> and uh, that would have been that. He would have got away with it uh, had it not been for the fact that uh, uh, Mariah Martin, the murdered woman, uh, her stepmother st started having these dreams uh, that Mariah came to her and, and, uh, uh, and said that she'd been murdered and buried in the barn and that she must go and look in the barn. And eventually she persuaded her husband to go and look. And they, they you know, he was digging around with his mole spike that he used to catch moles with and he you know came up with a piece of his daughter's flesh and, oh. uh, and you made this into a musical I turned it into a musical <laughs> yeah. which is my very gentle way of segueing to the gentleman on your right yes uh, this is Dan Schwartz who's our musical director um, and Dan and I uh, started working with each other probably at the end of last year 
Mm -hmm. um, Dan came to some of the summer shows in Griffith Park and uh, uh, um, to cut a long story short, he liked one of the tunes that we were working with in uh, Love's Labour's Lost, which I'd written, and uh, he offered to make a recording of it, which turned into a, a record of Shakespeare tunes. So well, how do you integrate yourself into this show? Um, you mean, what's my, what's my role in it? Yes, there. Ah, uh, well, um, on stage I'm playing bass and a little bit of keyboard and trying to keep the knobs in the right positions at the right time, but in preparation for it, it was really you know, helping David arrange the, the songs for the ensemble. You know, moving things around, getting, you know, figuring out where the singers should be harmonizing, that sort of thing. It's basic, you know, production. And in keeping with my history with your company, you use everything you got on stage for whatever good it can be. You have a piano player who plays roles in the show. Yeah, the piano. We tried to get Dan to play I something. But <laughs> I feel stupid enough wearing a costume. <laughs> That's right. You're well, all. Well, you go back to the early days of the dead, right? The dead would stumble on stage in whatever clothes they fell out of bed yes. in, right? Yes. I like as long those as those Marshall amplifiers were working, they <laughs> That's were. That's right. Those, were those are my people. <laughs> so, in, in terms of the show, uh, you have the play you've written, you have the songs you've written, and you have an ensemble. Mm -hmm. And you do the staging as well. Uh, Melissa Charles, my wife, who's the artistic director, and. Ah. Um, she, uh, she directed the show, and we co-wrote the, the book. And you get to play a kind of charming, villainous character. Oh, yeah, I play this guy called Beauty Smith, yeah. who's uh, a, a local, uh, local character. Who's, uh, everything in the show is more or less true. And this, this person who did exist um, had been transported twice to Australia and somehow managed to get back. <laughs> um, both times it was for, pig, uh, for stealing pigs. Although he was actually, you know, quite a significant criminal in London, uh, um, and uh, yeah, he's the, he's he's the sort of Mephistophelian character that leads the uh, uh, you young, know the young man, man astray and, and and sort of. Well, he's a pretty weak-willed young man. <laughs> he is, <laughs> but determined in his yes. way. <laughs> the the show has this lovely feel, the same kind of feel I felt when I first saw Henry V, that. You put it on with absolutely no money. Not that it, you didn't, but it has that look that you are, you're a comedian troupe that's arrived in town, just throws things up on the stage and do your art. Oh, yeah. Well, it did. It cost a bit more than Henry V because <laughs> <laughs> we had to rent a piano. Oh, well. Uh, but, you know, someone came in here and they said, oh, my God, I love the set. How, how did you find the money for this? And I said, we didn't. Somebody had five tins of white paint that they didn't know what to do with. So we thought, oh, we'll just paint it white. Um, so, uh, yeah, no, uh, it, it is, that's an aesthetic that we still work with, and, you know, even though in the summer, you know, the shows are getting really big, and because there are thousands of people watching, there needs to be more spectacle, and we actually have set designers, and a lot of thought goes into it, it we still work with a very sort of spare aesthetic, and, you know, uh, there, there are actually lighting cues in this show, but, oh, you wow. know, <laughs> but not very many, because we only have eight lights, but, you know, uh, but we, we're just used to working with that, and I think that that's engaging people's imagination uh, that way create, can create a very powerful experience. So. Where does your ensemble come from? I don't think you keep them locked in the back room. Do you do <laughs> oh, if I could. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, uh, we found most of them just through, oh, through completely different ways, really. I mean, uh, sometimes we, we have auditions every spring, uh, but generally speaking, we cast from the same group of people that, that it, it, often people find us by accident. You know, we, we need someone just for this show and there was, suddenly there isn't someone there. And then we, you know, we ask for friends for recommendations and then we get, uh, we cast someone and then we like them and they just sort of stay with us. So, you know, some of them are people like Danny Campbell, who's a, a colleague of Melissa's from her training program. There are a few people from the... University of Delaware, but you know, everyone else is just, they sort of find us, but always through very unorthodox ways. Now, it would be very difficult to bring the ensemble and have them in here performing live. And what we're going to see right now is the closing of Act One, the final number from the end of Act One, here on Theater Spotlight, and our focus on this musical, The Red Barn. Standing here with my 
Now, that was the first act closing number. Yes. And I really like the arrangement of it. David, how do you uh, arrange for the singers? Did you arrange the harmonies for the singers as well? Um, you know, these it's an amazingly talented group of people. I mean, oh, just a little side note. For me, the greatest pleasure in doing this is just watching them at work. Oh. They're having such a good time. But, you know, it's, it's really interesting. For the most part, where we needed harmonies, all I had to say or David had to say was, "Well, let's get some harmonies here." Yeah, <laughs> and, and they go to it. And sometimes they're not right, but 
ninety percent of the time they're dead on. You know, so there like there were there were moments where the pacing of something wasn't right. Uh, there's a segment in um, Rivers of Ice that Mary sings, and it sort of echoes an earlier uh, an earlier chunk of a of a song um, in the play that uh, Bob Buke sings. And I said, let's you know, let's do this as if the piano is a bell tone, and Mary's voice just sort of rings out, and the harmonies go underneath it, and they know exactly what to do. She, there's Mary standing over there, so I'm gesturing towards the door. But yeah, she knows, you know, how to pace it. But, you know, I don't know if it's because they were, you know, I've only been a part of this a very short time, so I haven't watched them come together. But it's amazing how little direction they need. Once you know, we need something here. The the talents in this group are pretty astonishing. Well, part of the interesting thing for the audience in the show is sitting back there, and out of the corner of your eye, you see uh, David, you shifting from the shifty-eyed thief to actually the guitarist in the band, yeah. and then back. Do you occasionally play bass, too, or just... Uh, Dan does all the bass. No, I, I, I claim and, the but bass. But your fingers sort of reach over and play keyboard. Yeah, yeah. And then come back in character and have the pianist all of a sudden playing a town judge. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's... Just interesting. It's very Comedia dell'arte-esque. Oh, I always wanted it to be like that. I always wanted the the, the band to be, you know, uh, integrated into the show and be, you know, characters as much as possible. I'm, I'm sorry that Dan, Dan does come on at the end and, and he's there for the execution. So, so how Reluctantly. how did this show develop? Did you write the play and then impose the music? Were you developed the music and the play? Well, I got the idea for it probably about seven years ago. And I wasn't thinking of writing a musical. I don't really, I mean, I, you know, I like musicals perfectly well, but I'm not a big sort of musical theater fan. Uh, but I, I was listening to Tommy by The Who, and I was thinking about writing a sort of song cycle like that. Uh, you know, because I've been writing the music for the Shakespeare shows, and I, I was just looking for a project where I could sort of, you know, as an exercise, you know, develop my songwriting. Uh, so I thought, well, Think of a story that you're familiar with, and, and write some songs based on that. And then this the uh, the idea of the murder in the red barn got popped into my head, and I thought that was, so. I was just I really just wrote a couple of songs about it, and then and then I had this idea that I would start incorporating uh, some dr dramatic moments, and then we could perform it as a rock group, and we could have actors, and they would be singing, and I create this hybrid of theatre that included music, singing, and acting. And it would be like nothing anyone had seen before. And I ran it by a friend, and he said, "Yes, actually, that's called a musical." <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, uh, I'm writing a musical. Okay. Um, and once I sort of uh, got used to the idea of that, I just went with it. And um, but it wasn't really. In, I wrote a few songs, but it wasn't until I'd finished the book that um, that I could really get into the rest of the songs because I didn't once I didn't know exactly what you know the story was and where the songs were going to come from. So. I spent seven years researching it, and uh, several times I had to sort of stop because the the subject matter is so dark that I started getting these intense nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, so, but I came back to it and got over that. Now, the show, it, developing it, rehearsing it, did it? Did the audience react to it the way you thought they would when you first opened or when first previewed it in front of real people? Um, yeah. Uh, I think so. I mean, I, I, well, they reacted better than I thought they would. <laughs> I mean, I, this is so such completely new territory for me. I'm used to producing and acting in Shakespeare plays. I've never been in a musical. I don't often go and watch them. <laughs> so uh, I, I was saying the other day, I feel a bit like uh, Felix Baumgartner jumping out of the space capsule. <laughs> I just, oh, well, here we go. <laughs> and, uh, and hoping that you land. And, and fortunately, uh, people reacted really well to it. I mean, there's, even though it's a really dark material, there's a lot of humor in it. And I'm glad that that's coming across. And it's, it's, I hoped that I was creating something that had that balance of tragedy and comedy that Shakespeare really likes and Chekhov really likes. I mean, not that I'm comparing myself to Shakespeare and Chekhov. But, you know, oh, uh, they do quite often. <laughs> um, now, were there laughs where you didn't expect laughs? Like you say, this can be a rather dark tale. Um, not there, really. There are a few awkward laughs. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah. Oh, don't ask me. <laughs> I'm just sitting up there hearing stuff. So. Well, we want the audience to come and enjoy this and yeah. find the laughs and the terror all on their own. But uh, you've only been open a few weeks, and yeah. already you're extending the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Uh, we're, yes, we're going to extend for four more performances after Thanksgiving. So we won't perform on Thanksgiving because I've learned as an Englishman that that's a bad time to do theatre. Um, uh, but the week week after, we're going to have four more shows. So we'll be now closing on December 9th. Uh -huh. I'm fascinated by this building. For one thing, I had a hard time finding it. <laughs> Open it up, I went the wrong way because there are no clues out in the street. But anyway, I did find it. And then I guess I walked in the wrong end of the building and passed about 12 other enterprise, other enterprises before I got to you. What is this building? Well, this, all, this whole street is called Atwater Crossing, and it's a complex of warehouses uh, that are mostly, you know, uh, most of the tenants are sort of creative people or, you know, uh, companies. There's several theaters. At the top there, we've got uh, Ensemble Studio Theater and Circle X. And, on the opposite end of this building, we have the Atwater Playhouse and uh, the, the Atwater Method Acting School. So wow. on the opposite end of the spectrum from the Independent Shakespeare Company, it's funny, we're on opposite ends of the building and you know, we have these very different kind of disciplines. You really need a pub right in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like one of the things about ISC, um, the reason I got involved uh, last year was because you know, I heard these astonishingly beautiful settings for Shakespeare's songs. And what they do, they do for free. This is free, to, not this, but you know, in the park, what they do is free the public. What David and Melissa have put together here with the group is the closest I've ever seen to what I imagine San Francisco was like 40 years ago. Oh, yes. You know, I remember it well. I'm sure you do, which is why I bring it up. I mean, it is, it is very community oriented. It's very, as David said, it's very Felix Baumgartner like, you know, well, we just throw ourselves out and see what happens. And the audience receives that in the spirit in which it's offered, which is, the audience knows everybody's skating on thin ice here, and the possibility of rising because of that is astonishing. You know, versus a really tightly organized show right. in which everything is everything is known, the lighting is all everything is put together, and there's never going to be a mistake. Right? Well, you know how boring that can be, <laughs> right? And I, you know, as a musician, I've always chafed at really tightly put together shows because. There's no, there's no freedom. There's no capacity to discover something in the moment that causes everybody to rise up. This is a group of people who allows for that possibility on a level that I have not seen in all the years I've been in L.A. They're the closest thing to punk or hippies I've seen in 30 years. <laughs> well, the one Which thing is going to humiliate them. <laughs> no, I want to put that in our, our marketing materials. <laughs> well, the one thing about punks and hippies, they can at least go their own way if they so choose. Mm -hmm. But now we have a writer who has to go home with the director. Yeah. <laughs> How does that work? Uh, you know, we have a really good marriage, and uh, um, things like this actually bring us closer. Uh, we've had a great time working on this show. Melissa and I, you know, I think it's one of the things that we've been proudest of in recent years, and, you know, uh, sometimes putting on the, the pressure of mounting the big festival in the, in the summer is... You know, you know, we had like nearly forty thousand people come this year, so it's becoming a quite a big thing. And uh, sometimes it's a headache producing because it's all about money. You have to, you know, mm -hmm. everyone has to be paid. You know, all the actors get paid, so the, you know, the uh, the budget has just gone through the roof. And, and so that's very stressful for us to have to deal with. And often we find ourselves sitting around the kitchen table talking about things that. You know, a couple probably shouldn't be talking about. Surrounded uh, by a lot of knives. So a lot of <laughs> knives and two children <laughs> are, are quite vociferous. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, so we go through periods, and it, de also, it often depends what play we're doing. If we're working on uh, the Scottish play, and we're playing the Scottish couple, uh, it's it's a nightmare for everybody involved. You know, <laughs> <laughs> we just we we don't get along. But then you know, some plays like Much Do About Nothing. It was great. You know, we, we really it was. So, uh, you know, I, we're not very good at, uh, at, at leaving the work in the, where the work should be. But, you know, I, I, I think a lot of this is uh, an expression of who we are as a couple and, and our sort of uh, uh, artistic aesthetic. But um, it generally works. <laughs> now, you took Melissa back to this area where this is set, did, mm -hmm. didn't you? Oh, we were married there, yeah. Oh, yeah. how macabre. Uh, oh no, not in Polstead. No, we were, <laughs> but my my village is right next door, so and we have family friends in Polstead, so we you know we go there a lot. Did she know of this tale beforehand? Did, uh, did yeah, you take her to the Red Barn? Yeah. Uh, well, the Red Barn isn't there. Everything else is there. The village is 
is more or less untouched and looked ex looks exactly like it did in uh, 1827. Oh, I'm sure back then murders were not... Oh, not uncommon murder. at all. I think that it really appealed to the Victorian society. Well, it wasn't quite Victorian society when it happened, but uh, we're going, going into it. Um, just uh, it, it instantly became a smash in the in the musicals and the, the sort of you know the, the penny dreadfuls and the theaters and um, uh, because it appealed to the masses because there was this story about you know the the working class being subdued by the aristocratic toffs. Uh, you know, I often wonder what would happen if Brecht had got hold of this story. It was the kind of thing <laughs> he would absolutely love. But um, so. That was one of the reasons I think why it was really appealing, and, and it played all through that century as a as a melodrama, really? which actually had little bearing to do with the actual facts. They invented all these avenging gypsies and curses, and so you know. it was done as a stage play, or was it? Oh, there was there were stage representations of it even before William Corder was hung. Oh God! Gotcha. Um, and in the nineteenth century, it was it was second only in popularity to uh, uh, Sweeney Todd. Uh, ah. The melodrama of Sweeney Todd, not you know, Sondheim's music. Murderers are big time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, um, and uh, it was performed even into the 20th century. This guy Todd Slaughter was running it up into the late 20s and made a fortune out of it. Um, uh, still, it's still in Britain. The the old melodrama will get be perf will be performed, but mostly by sort of community theatre groups. And I mean, it, it's 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 hysterically funny, but it's not very playable. But it's still very well known. I have a few friends in London. I said, well, I'm involved in this musical. And, you know, I link them to the IRC website. And they go, oh, Mariah Martin, sure. So <laughs> people you know, still know it. Well, I have to say, as uh, an impartial audience member, I was really drawn to Mary Gwillem's performance as this historical character uh, who came from, I guess you would say, from the lower classes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just loved the reaction of her, of total acceptance to her stated life, making the best of it and enjoying it, expecting something when something is promised to her with almost a naive innocence. But yet she's a very lusty young woman who totally is accepting of the needs of the men in her life and her past <laughs> and has gone right with it and just expects to have something positive come out of it. So it is part of the great drama of this, that what happens to her is so totally unfair to the characters she is. Oh, I'm so glad to hear you say that, because we worked really hard on, on that. You know, no one worked harder than Mary. <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, the, the story, the melodrama, if you go back to how it was performed in the 19th century, they treat her as uh, this sort of innocent virgin who uh, was, you know, uh, Deflowered and desecrated. Children, well, in reality, yeah, she <laughs> fathered a few children, and uh, she's not by no means innocent. Uh, uh, so, you know, it's. Uh, I think what Mary's doing is re is really quite nuanced, and and uh, uh, I don't think you could get away with this present, this portrayal of it. Certainly not in the nineteenth century, and even in you know most of the twentieth century, because uh, I think we would be censorious about her <laughs> her, her moral life, but. Thank God, in the 21st century, we can actually be realistic about it and say that, yes, people actually do have sex. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, the reason I bring up Mary Grolin at this particular part is because here on LARStream.com, on Theater Spotlight, you're going to be able to hear Mary Grolin in the flesh, or in the vocal flesh. Anyway, because uh, we're going to have a, a presentation of Mary performing the title song. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're going to. Well, <laughs> does Mary know this? <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, folks, you have been watching Theater Spotlight. I am your host, Julio Martinez, my guest, David Melville, and Mr. David Schwartz. Dan Schwartz. What are they? Dan Schwartz. And Mary, nice. Mary Williams. 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 Oh. But we're going to change my name to David because everybody else involved is involved. This just makes things easier. So, right now, I really would love to have you here, Mr. Miss, Ms. Mary Williams singing the title song from The Red Barn. Come and see me I'll be waiting alone With 
heart beating still, I will be there until you find me at the red lawn. Wash the color of blood when it's hit by the sun, standing alone on the horizon. Why'd you go 